Good morning and welcome to our hybrid program of the AYC in Lahti in Finland. Um, I'm Mike Ostroblanovic. It's nice for you to turn in again to our workshop session. And today we have a really interesting workshop. Kert, please come here. No pressure. <laughs> so, who are you? What do you do? What is the topic of the workshop? I'm Kert Lazic. Uh, at the moment, I'm a mom. Uh, <laughs> it's a full-time job. That is a full-time <laughs> job. Uh, and if you hear somebody from the back screaming, then it's probably my husband. <laughs> 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 Actually, I meant Sara. Um, but yes, I um, I think uh, my my bio on the app also says that I'm. Uh, I'm fond of everything connected to communication. And when it comes to um, coming together as a church, then a lot of that communication mm. happens, like this type of public communication happens from the platform, mm. happens during the worship sessions. Mm. And yep, that's uh, my, my field is languages and literature and culture uh, at the back of all of that. So what was the title of the workshop? Plug into creative worship. Yes. It's all yours. And thank you so much. And thank you all for, well, <laughs> for welcoming my introduction so warmly. Um, thank you for showing up. Um, there were supposed to be slides, but we are going to wing it because the, the tech is not collaborating at the moment. And I think it's even better because this way uh, you have to do more work yourself. So pedagogically, this should be a better workshop. Um, creative worship. It sounds like a really simple title, but actually when we go into it, what does it mean? Creative? What does it mean? Worship. The first question to you is, what is worship? Could you turn around to anyone next to you and whisper quietly what you think? You would say, if anyone asks you, what worship? <laughs> hmm? We all do it if we are kind of a part of the church, but what is it? Five, four, done. So, shout out some of the ideas that you heard. Oh, there we go. Now, Mike has to run with the mic. <laughs> so, where was it? It's like praising God. Praising God. Mm -hmm. Yep, there we go. Um, us responding to God's love for us. Us responding to God's love for us. I like to put an asterisk next to that one, Angeline. You get, get such a workout out of this. Uh, just intentionality of everything you do in life that you're connected. Mm -hmm. Staying intentionally connected through everything you do in life. Mm -hmm. <laughs> posture of heart and lifestyle. Mm -hmm. A posture of heart and lifestyle. That's nice. Let's give the theologian a word at the very end. <laughs> If there is worship, it means that somebody is worthy of something. Mm -hmm. So it means that I am in a moment that I am being in front of somebody worthy. So I'm like being humbling myself yes. in front of somebody who is worthy of my praise. Mm -hmm. So my praise goes in a humbling way to somebody that has given me everything. So I guess worship is that connection. That kind of, a, it's, a, it's, a relation, it's a type of relationship, a certain type of positioning, right? Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. Anyone else? Yep. Ha ha ha. Let's do more of that for Mike, please. Yes. There, I was just thinking of, you know, the two ideas of worship that like the actual worship service itself and then like your lifestyle as a, you know, living all the time in a, you know, worshiping style with God in a relationship in yes. with others as well. Yes. And you pointed out a really good, uh, a really good thing because it can be done in different ways. We've got some really, really general comments on this type of posture or lifestyle or intentional living, breathing, technically. Um, but then there is this practice that we do together when we come together. And we also call this worship. <laughs> we come together for worship and then somehow it takes on a slightly, it becomes a genre. 
it's almost like uh, there's worship and then there's sub-genre of worship. It's communal worship that we do together. And we also call that worship, right? So it's a bit confusing. And then, and then obviously, we come from a tradition where a lot, of, a lot of the first associations with the word worship have to do with music. And if you signed up in the app and you checked what kind of questions had popped up before that, that was one of the questions. Before, before one of you decided to sign up, the question was, is this just about music or is it about more? Because traditionally, the word worship has popped up in relation to music a whole lot. And I passionately feel that it's horribly reductionist with all due respect to our music worship team. Um, but... But, but reducing the concept of worship to just music is, uh, is outrageously unbalanced. <laughs> um, Dihi, do you still want to say something, or are you going to let your wife talk? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, actually, I have a suspicious feeling that what Dihi would have wanted to say is something like this, if you can see. Responding to all that God is with all that we are. Yes, there we go. I'm a good learner. Um, so this is kind of actually something that we can, we can pull together from what you guys in this corner uh, already highlighted. It's just phrased in a way that I am ho horribly fond of because it is so succinct and at the same time it captures the essence of it because each word weighs a lot. Responding comes to the idea that you've already recognized something. Something has been initiated by God, by what he's done and by who he is, by what they've done and by what they are, and, and the recognition that something has happened before we can start worshiping. So you respond to something. To all that God is, the idea is that we are striving for for the totality, right? Constantly keeping in mind that we will always be limited in that. But we are striving to kind of understand the spectrum of what, what God can be. And our task is not to pick and choose what we want from that mighty creature. Not, no, not creature. The, the only non-creature. Uh, from that mighty being. Um, but, but our task is to both individually and collectively, try to respond to as much of that as possible. So, so the lion and the lamb, you know, all of it. Um, with all that we are. And that now becomes a question of, of a posture in life, of intentionality, of breathing with a certain mindset, with a certain attitude. Um, and also, if we talk about doing this together, which is what will be our primary focus today, in a communal setting could be added to this. So what happens when we come together to do that? And in very many ways, it's easier to do this alone or with a friend who thinks exactly like us, you know? Um, but when we come together as a group who is diverse and complex and twisted and, and shaped in all sorts of different ways, uh, this becomes both a challenge and a blessing. And I, I would like us to keep all of that at the back of our heads throughout what we will be talking about during the next minutes. Now, what about the word creative? Now, that too is more complex than I would have assumed at the beginning. You know, uh, you can use the word creative for someone who just... Uh, who can't show up right, uh, right on time to a place. And you go, oh, they're the creatives type, you know. <laughs> um, fortunately, they didn't even hear that. <laughs> but I've got that myself. Oh, the creative type. What do you do? They can't show up on time. Um, then you have people who come up with really creative solutions, you know. Uh, you can also say, oh, that was creative. Um, and, uh, and that kind of means that something was attempted and probably didn't land very well. But I actually turned to dictionaries for that one. And it's interesting that uh, if you check the Oxford Dictionary and the Cambridge Dictionary, uh, um, Merriam-Webster, um, their definitions are there, but they hardly overlap, which tells you something. Um, one of the dic dictionary uh, definitions is marked by the ability or power to create. So if a person is creative, they have the power or the ability to create. 
And I would like you to also keep that in mind in the context of today's title, creative worship as having the power to create, right? As having a certain type of agency to make a change or make a difference. The second definition would be relating to the use of the imagination or original ideas to create something. And I think this is what, how we usually use it. The idea is that, that uh, we use imagination and, we, and, and it has to be original to be creative. So in this case, creative is the opposite of kind of um, worn ideas or the trodden paths, right? You have to be creative. You have to make your own way. It has to be different from anything that's been done before. Um, and the third one is having the quality of something created rather than imitated. And I really like that one, right? Because, uh, because there the opposition is not necessarily of intentionally having to do something radically new. But the question is, are you making it or are you just imitating something? Keep all these three at the back of your heads as you think about creative worship. And not just today, but when you go back and you are searching for this something, that, that when you are trying to figure out what you find. You know, we usually start thinking about this when we, when we feel like there's a dissatisfaction in our hearts. It's like something, we come together and something is happening, but it's not, <clears throat> it's not landing in in the right spot for me and uh, or we see it not landing for somebody else and then we start throwing these words around we need to be more creative what does that actually mean and already from these three definitions you can see that it can mean a lot of different things and for some people the most creative worship in the sense of something that creates something for them is the most traditional way of doing it because it actually works for them. Now that's not a message you want to hear as the first point of a creative worship workshop at a youth congress. <laughs> but I have to put that asterisk everywhere that, that I am kind of like, um, I'm a fairly pragmatic, rational creature. And one of my asterisks in life is hold your horses before you gallop off because there might be some value in what you are leaving behind. Mm -hmm. Then innovate, mm -hmm. then innovate. Um, so um, what do we do with all of this? I would like to address four different questions really quickly. And then I would like us to go into the practical, into a practical task. If we don't manage this in time, you can send me your homework afterwards. <laughs> um, I would like to ask who, I would like to ask why, what, and then the how. Very often we jump to the how before asking the first three questions. Who, why, and what. And then we end up with messes, and we end up with churches being split apart, and we end up with these generational wars, because everyone is operating on the level of how. I would like to propose that if you start with the three other questions first, a lot of the war and the battling at the surface level is going to just fade out. Who? You remember that was also a poll question about whether you experience God the most meaningfully, well, in your experiences so far, as a creator of creative acts or as a person receiving them. In very blunt terms, are you the one on the platform or are you the one in the pews? You know, are you the one doing the artwork or are you the one beholding it? Um, and you would have, more people experience it through the creative acts of somebody else. At least that's what they claim. And it is absolutely possible. It's also possible that in the definition of creative act, they have reduced it to acts of creating visual arts or music and have taken out creative solutions to practical problems, for example, or, or figuring out something technical 
we could have had more creative solutions here today for our PowerPoint, but we're figuring it out as we go. And that is creativity, that is creating something that is not, you know, that is, that is bypassing the strand of the, the, the trail of thought that we had for today. So we have, so to say, the preparers and we have, so to say, the receivers. And very often we think about it in this way. I would like to challenge the word receivers, even though I myself put it on the table. But we often talk about it in church also, performers and the audience, which is a remarkably messed up uh, vocabulary for talking about church and worship. Um, we, we talk about somebody who has prepared something and then somebody who's supposed to sit there and passively take it all in. Um, and that's not how this works. So from this point on, I would like to rather talk about prepare, preparers and participants. So somebody who thinks about it in advance and then somebody who comes and joins that and makes it happen actively, not as a passive, uh, passive just viewer. But more about that in literally just a moment. Then we have the question of why. Why bother? Why talk about creative worship? Why is this, you know, is this one of those hip things that your grandma says, ah, oh, you know, o tempora, o mores, you know. Um, but actually, I would like to claim that there are very good theological reasons for talking about creativity. And two in particular. Uh, there are definitely more, but two in particular. The first one is the idea of imago dei. We have been created in God's image. If we want to understand and live that reality as the image of God that David Asherick was talking about yesterday, then one of the aspects is that we are created in God's image and that God is a creator. So we are created in the image of a creator. So you could say that creating and creativity is written into our DNA from creation. This happens in procreation, right? Go and multiply, but not just that. We have been created not only to be many, but also to be the type of a, the type of a being that, that imagined the flowers, that imagined the fish in all their weird forms, that imagined the science of the universe, that imagined all of that out of the blue and then made it happen. We are called to be created because we are created in the image of a creator. Now, second point is that our response to that creator is supposed to be a 360 full life response. We are called in both the Old Testament and the New Testament to love God with all our hearts, all our body, all our mind, all our everything, body, soul, and mind, you know, all of it. And if we have a creative streak, we cannot just exclude it and say everything, but not that side of me. Because if we are talking about holistic worship of God, it's supposed to include the fact that as humans, we are creative. It's supposed to be there, and if we don't bring it to the table, we are keeping something from God. We are also keeping something from each other that could be a blessing to the ones around us so that they could see a different aspect of the image of God through my creativity, through your creativity. So those two points, even though there could be many more, much more could be said about it. I was thinking that I should create... Um, like a little speech bubble for David Asherick yesterday, because he had to say it so many times that I thought that it would be <laughs> time saving if he just put the bubble up whenever much, could, much more could be said about it. Um, but it's true, much more could be said about it, but those two points in themselves are sufficient. We are created that way, and since we are created that way, it's a part of our being. If we hold it back from worship, we are literally keeping things from God. And the second aspect that kind of derives from that is the psychological aspect of it. We are made to, to perceive, to consume the world around us, to make sense of it, to make meaning of the things around us in multiple ways. Some more direct and some more 
creative. We are made to do that in different ways. And if we forget about that aspect, we are again, we are closing up channels of God's communication to us. And that would be a shame if we only adopt, let's say, I, I adopt the, the way that Dihi understands God, um, and, and I go, that's the way to do it because he has a theology degree and I don't, uh, so this must be the holier path. And, uh, and I get it and I enjoy parts of it, but some of that stuff does not speak straight to my heart. And because Dihi is different, then I would shut out some of those parts that could actually touch my heart in the most meaningful way. So I, I am a passionate advocate for each of us figuring out our meaningful channels and mapping them and working intentionally to then use them in our communication and our response with God. There's also the element of learning. We learn the best when we make sense of things for ourselves. And this is where creative spaces come really to the fore. If I just give you the answers and you just imitate the answers, it will make sense, but it will not be yours. It will be mine, parroted by somebody else. Creative spaces are the places where we are called to make sense of it for ourselves. They're dangerous because you might end up making sense of things differently from me, and I will lose control over what you think. But unless I create that space, you will never know for yourself. That's now a challenge for anyone creating communal worship spaces where we come together for worship. Is this a controlled space of let me dictate and you parrot? Or is this a space where we allow people to actually engage with the material, to engage with, not even material, that's such an Adventist thing to say, to engage with God and actually experience something that is fresh and meaningful for them. It's also crucial for community. Coming together and me hearing things, seeing things, experiencing things created by others, reminds me constantly that God is bigger than me. And there might be things I really don't understand if I have accepted the fact that God is bigger than me, that is fine. It doesn't mean that it's wrong. Did you follow that part? That's really crucial. <laughs> That's really crucial when we come together as a congregation because we often think it didn't work, thus it does not work, period, objectively, universally. No, it didn't work for me. But maybe it did for so many others. What? I already mentioned that. When we come together for communal worship, then what do we do? We respond to God, to all of that, all of God, all, what, all that God is, with all that we are, as a community. And there are certain people who, by position, by their talents, by their gifting, have been placed in that community to create a special space for that. Usually, Friday evenings and or Sabbath mornings, um, people come together and somebody puts a lot of thought into how to create that space. Now, that space is not to teach, that space is not to get things right, that space is for people in that community to have an encounter with God. Now, that's not something that I am in control of. I can't control what God does or does not do. But if I am the creator of that space, I can facilitate it or be an obstacle to it. I can ruin things in that space. I can also make choices that create the most favorable space for that encounter. I don't know if you think about it that way. When we come to the church on Sabbath morning, when we, when we stand up and, and we open the hymnals and we sing the first song, this is what we are doing. 
we are creating a space for ourselves and for the person next to me for encountering God in a special way. The prayers are for that. The, the, the offering is for that. The sermon, we're used to thinking that the sermon is for that. But the whole thing from the moment that you step into that building, from the moment that you actually enter the parking lot, that is supposed to be creating a space that favors, that supports the encounter, my encounter with God and the people next to me. I'm not just individualistically responsible for myself. I am responsible for the one sitting next to me. That's another thing we forget about. If I choose to disengage the space for the person sitting next to me will be different from when I choose to engage. It's a huge responsibility when you think about it. You might think, oh, better not show up. What if I ruin something for someone? Well, you not showing up also shapes that space. There's an empty seat and there's a perspective that's missing. Now, there's a couple of crucial principles that I would like to mention in relation to the how. If, if anyone asks, yes, but how do I do it? It's always so tempting to go for checklists and to go for, uh, you know, like, and here's a, here's a Pinterest board that I prepared for you with all the activities that you need to do to be creative. That is literally contradicting itself. Um, no, you don't go more on my Pinterest board to imitate. No, you start creating a creative space from content to form. Right? And that's, I, if you don't take anything else away from here today, from content to form. If we start from content, the form will follow. Too often we go about things in a way where we go like, this needs to be, I mean, looking at the demographic here, this needs to be a youth event, thus it will be dark, it will have neon lights, it will have, uh, it will have, um, you know, it will have the latest songs by Hillsong, right? Like, whoo, let's go upstairs and see what we have. <laughs> this is not a critique, but if we start from that point, it should be critiqued. If we come together and we go, so we have a bunch of young people coming together and we want to give them a certain type of space for them to experience God in a certain type of way. We want them to feel connected. We want them to feel focused. We want them to feel like the rest of the world is cut out from that space and all of their eyes are drawn to the center where you receive input that should help us worship together. Then you go, oh yeah, maybe we should make the room dark. Right? But only then and only then are you, following my, are you following my drift. That's also the best way to avoid culture wars at the surface level. When someone comes to you and they go like, why is the room dark? This is not how we used to do it in my childhood, right? Darkness is evil. <laughs> then you can go, I understand where you're coming from. And instead of saying, well, we're the youth, we're going to do it our way, you can go, here's the logic behind it. We wanted to really cut off all the senses so that people could visually be drawn to the center to help the people who have grown up as digital, uh, basically like hybrids, <laughs> um, who are constantly bombarded with information, who's whose visual senses are overworked, we need to give them a place of peace and a space that facilitates focusing. That is why we cut off the, you know, all the beautiful windows that I know you invested your money on in the, in the 70s, <laughs> right? Um, trust me, if you approach it from that angle, the discussion will take a different turn. They will still potentially have an issue with that. But it is no longer a matter of I want, you want, I like, you like, 
um, the youth are this and the older generations like that. No, it's a matter of intention that is coming not from the form, but from the content. From my desire to create an environment that facilitates the encounter for everyone present. I would also say that we have to be super wise about this. We have to be wise because we need to remember that people... In, over here it's easy to talk about ooh, different cultures coming together, different languages coming together. They're a bit different, they're a bit different. We laugh at the Finns for not wanting people to be close to them. We laugh at the Spanish people for not knowing how to cue, you know. Um, all of those things are amazing because we are here for five days and then we go our separate ways and we can forgive them their wonderful quirks. If we go to our local congregation, we might even look the same. We might all be Estonians, all be Finnish, all be Spanish, but honestly, the discrepancies just create friction, right? That old person who invested into those windows in the 70s is sitting at the back of this church like she owns it. And frankly, she did invest in the window, so she kind of does. Um, she is not a crazy old lady. She's a person who has come to that space to encounter God and who is terrified of the darkness because of her particular peculiar story. If we steamroll over her, we'll have created immense amounts of pain to somebody whose home this used to be spiritually, physically, emotionally, socially for way longer than this has been for us. Wisely. Tread wisely and carefully. If we come together as a community, it has to be a facilitation for me, but also for that lady at the back. How do we make that work? We make it work by caring and communicating. If you know that lady's story and why she doesn't like the dark, why she really... It's so easy to draw these discussions to the theological, logical, um, you know, fact-checking. It's like, does the Bible say this? Does the Bible say that? And then you go like, well, you know, Lucifer is the light, so you could say that light is evil. Um, you know, <laughs> you could draw all sorts of interesting things from that. And that's what Adventists are very good at doing. We draw it to the plane of theological right and theological wrong. And we forget that subscription to certain theological right or theological wrong comes from your personal experience and your personal stories. And we can fight all we want at that level unless we go and we understand that lady. You know, if you actually hear the, her story, you might come together over a cup of tea and she might listen to yours and you might listen to hers and you might go like, okay, let's do it 50-50. Once your way, once my way. Dark light, dark light. We can even session them that way, you know. We have the dark service and the light service. Um, it might be that when you listen to her story, you will never want to put her in a dark room because you will know that this fear and that experience comes from a place that you've never experienced. And because you now know her story, you care enough not to want to cause that type of pain. Right? Create spaces where you can listen to people and listen to the weirdest ones and try to create spaces where you can tell your story honestly from inside out, so that they would too hear you, not for your proclamations, but for your story, for your needs, for your cravings, right? This is where community and church truly happens. Not whether there are lights or are not lights, but in us coming together and seeing the miracle of God creating a space where we can encounter him through the story of that lady. And she can encounter God in whole new ways through your story. Now, if we forget about that part, we are doing 
We're doing a disservice to ourselves, to our community and to God because we are boxing him into categories that he never even wanted to address. Lastly, definitely make it happen. Now, having said tread cautiously, tread cautiously, tread intentionally and determinedly towards making those spaces like that. It's too easy letting our collective pathologies and individual pathologies block out an opportunity for God's spirit to truly work within us as a community. And this is literally what will happen unless we try to break apart those bits that have become empty. Unless we try to figure out which parts still have content and which parts don't. Unless we figure out how to do this together so that the past can be in the present and the future can be here informing how we are, that the people out there, it's another very Adventist thing to say, the people out there um, would also somehow be able to find this a meaningful space. But whatever you need to do is a whole lot of labor. So if if anyone hoped to go away with, um, you know, with a, with a trick, there is no trick. There's just commitment to a labor. But it can be such a blessing. Now, having put all of that out there, I have a challenge for you. We have 20 minutes and I would like you to imagine that you in a group of let's say three to five people, organize however you wish. Also, Dihi, how are you keeping Sara so quiet? Yeah. We don't want to know. <laughs> so, yes? Oh, yes. Let's do questions. Yes. Yes. So it's quite common when we talk about worship. Yes. Some people say that, oh, it's not about your way or your creativity way. Yes. It's about how God wants. Yes. No. So, and usually it's interesting that usually when people say that, the way that they want is the same as God wants. It's very yes. interesting that it's very similar. <laughs> but how would you respond to this? It's, uh, it's when we talk about worship. Yes. It's more how I respond to God yes. or more to find a way that God wants me to respond to him. Yes. Does that make sense? Yes, it makes okay. perfect sense. And I think that that was a, that was, that was, yes. <laughs> um, there's, a, there's a good brain answer to that. I don't know what the heart answer to that is, if that makes sense. Like, as I mentioned, a lot of the times this comes from a point of psychology, mm -hmm. not necessarily a point of theology. Mm -hmm. And that's where it gets really tough. Theologically, it's possible to demonstrate that the only direct instructions for doing worship, like concrete God-given directives in the Bible, correct me if I'm wrong, Tihi, they are from the tabernacle. And we're not doing that. We're not coming together to eat lamb. Why aren't we? We should, right? The second layer that we have been commanded to do is the, is the, uh, is the foot washing and the, and, the, and the bread and the wine. Again, skipping the lamb, which was on the table in the upper room. And we just, we just, it's, yes, it's one, one of my pet peeves with our movement. Um, so. And even that one, a complete, a full meal, not just a small piece. No, exactly. You finish a full lamb. Yes. You walk into a barbecue party when you, go to, when you go to the tabernacle, right? You smell it from far away. You walk with your fingers in the fleece of the lamb that you are bringing to the slaughter, right? Uh, you, you hear the music, you hear the commotion. Do you think the animals were quiet? No, they were not. There was no sermon given at the time, you know? If you go to that level theologically, like what you can actually pinpoint biblically, you end up with a service that has almost zero elements in common with what we do today. The same applies to when you go to the, the book of Acts, right? That was music, that's for sure. But they also ate together, they did other things together, right? They read the Bible together. 
I don't know how often it happened that somebody would get up on the pulpit in a suit, you know. So, so all of that, all of that is actually, well, that's the, that's the 19th century US that has landed on our tables. And with all due respect to all of that culture, some of those things need to be revised as things that were relevant because somebody was being creative in that context from inside out. But if you are being creative in your context from inside out, it might lead to a slightly different configuration of things. Now, having said that, the inside out still happens in a cultural context, not just of Finland, not just of Europe, of our century, which is the 21st century, um, but it also happens in the context of Adventist church, of a certain amount of age. So you cannot, like, well, maybe you can, that's wrong of me to say, but you shouldn't forget about that element as a significant cultural component to your community. You can't just, I guess what I'm trying to say is that you can't throw it out of the window as completely wrong and outrageously off, right? Um, a lot of the things that we are currently doing, a lot of the things that are in the elders' manuals for worship and how we put together our services, they come from a place that is entirely inside out. It is not imposed randomly. There is logic behind it. There's a way of figuring out how you move through the, the psychological, emotional arc of, of, of worshipping. Um, it makes sense. And it definitely came from, from here. But it was not God-given exclusive universal directive to how we should be doing things when we come together. And that's the theological answer to that. Psychologically, realizing that I'm not youth anymore, and I'm sure that there are others in this group, we kind of, I'm starting to get like flavors of those moments where I go like, well, you know, why can't we do things the way that they are good, you know? It's like, do you really need to change everything? Um, and I am only, I'm, I'm, I'm hearing those moments at the back of my head, and I'm realizing that it's only going to increase because with my age, my kind of my, my highlight, <laughs> my highlights will have fixated in my yesteryear and my, and my like the, the, the avenues of my soul and my neuro pathways become more solid, less flexible, less creative in that sense. It will be harder and harder for me. It will take more and more labor, more brain labor to edit my heart in a context of change. And at one point, I might be incapable of doing that. I pray to God, and I've told my friends <laughs> that, you know, come and knock on my shoulder when you see that I've lost it. Like, when you see that, I'm, when you see that I am becoming an obstacle. <laughs> but, but I know that, that it will take more and more labor from me. So in that sense, there's a reason in that story why they would, they, why, why they would think that this is God's way only. And explaining it theologically will only go so far. Do we have any other questions? We do, over there. Um, yeah, I'll try to say it as best as I can. My English is not great at all. It sounds amazing. Um, well, you were talking about worship and that worship is responding to God, but also that we have some sort of responsibilities towards working together with other people who have different views. But I struggle a bit with um, how far does that responsibility go? So what kind of responsibilities do we have towards our receivers, so to say, yes. when you want to create something? For example, I really like to skate, I figure skate, but I know that if I would worship in that way by making, I don't know, videos, for example, that maybe some people would find it very, they, they would be very put off by it because, yes. you know, movement, that is not something very... Um, that Adventist. Adventist. <laughs> <laughs> That's yes. not very Adventist. So I worship them for myself. 
Yes. But worship is also something that should be shared. Yes. But people, um, some people wouldn't, wouldn't want that sort of sharing mm -hmm. to them. So that's hard for me. Like, is it for who is worship in human context? It is for God, obviously. Yes. But is it more for me? Or also, mm -hmm. do I have a responsibility towards the people in my surroundings to share it in a way that they want it to be? Yes. In their view, so to say. Now, that is an excellent question. And that will forever be... I don't know if you remember that, was, uh, if you've checked the questions and the answers. And by the way, go to the app and continue the discussion. I would love to have like lengthy discussions with you because 60 minutes for me is just like, what is that even? <laughs> but, um, but that is one of the elements that I mentioned, that kind of tension. One of the tensions is the past and the, and the future that we are. And I didn't even mention that part. We talk about the past and the present. But, but being, a, being a mother now to really tiny kids, I am finding myself at a really hard place where I think that I'm not just responsible to you guys as the present, I am slowly becoming the yesterday, but I am also responsible for my church, for them. And honestly, they will have no idea how to read what is meaningful for me. In, like, because of their culture, and, and that is freaking me out in horrible ways because, <laughs> because I am worried that the church that I will currently be maintaining and holding and, and establishing will be an alien for my child because it will still be the church from the 19th century US and they are here in the 21st century digitalized and whatever is coming next, um, Europe. And this will, you know, I have a duty to them, to the tomorrow. And that's something that we also need to keep in mind. But, but sorry, that was just the introduction to the answer. <laughs> but the tension between, between the individual and between the communal is... Is, a, is another one that we need to keep in mind. There's a level of, uh, there's a level of abuse on both sides. If you go to the side that the community only takes their common shared ground, it reduces everyone to the least common denominator. You know that in maths, right? You reduce everything to that, which then means that something, somebody, get, everyone gets something, for food, but not the full diet that they need, right? It reduces also God to only the things, that it reduces God to sameness. We only do the things, we, we see God as a community through the things that we all understand, which means God is in that space. But what about diversity, right? Then there's the alternative where you go like, oh, I don't care, this is how I worship God, let me roll a slate all over this platform over here, and you figure this out, uh, you know, so this is my worship, stand in awe. Um, and that's also abusive because people get confused, people have thoughts that they, you know, it's, it's not in any way upbuilding or creative. Um, <clears throat> there's a common ground, there's, there's, a, there's a balance somewhere in between. And I think that that balance is a very fine balance between safety and discomfort. If we are growing, there's supposed to always be a level of discomfort. If it fits you perfectly, you should be worried. Like if the picture of God fits you and your reality perfectly, you should really be worried. It's a comfortable place to be in, but you should be worried. And, uh, and the same for communal worship. If you realize that it looks so much like me from weekend to weekend, you should be worried about the people in your congregation that it does not look like because they are out there. So, so that, that's an absolute must to consider. I don't know if roller skating straight into it helps, but if you are the one who is preparing those spaces, I'm a teacher. I believe also in intentional, constant education and expanding of the horizons of us as a community. So do things that will help them get the literacy for reading somebody else's world and somebody else's story with God. Do it gradually, build up to that, and maybe one day, bef 
if your knees don't give up before that, maybe one day you'll end up in a place where you can roller skate for God in a community. Mm. Having said that, I have currently for about three years been in a place where I'm like, nah, we're never going to get there. I will drop dead before it happens. And then the question is, what do you need to do with the fact that your needs are not met in your community ever? Mm. Or that your ultimate gifts are never needed in that community? Then the answer is you go outside and you roller skate for God in a communal setting that is not church. But you do it for somebody else, with somebody else, and they will meet God through your roller skating. And you will have a church that does roller skating and goes like, we never sing. <laughs> <laughs> so you can just do that, yeah. Just a follow-up question on that. Um, what, you know, sometimes it's being argued, don't be a stumbling block, you know, yes. biblical. And, and then, you know, we utilize Paul, you know, the strong in faith and the weak in faith, yes. by the way, the strong where the ones eating meat. Yes. Um, and I, I wonder sometimes, uh, and, and also here the comment is, uh, uh, that are we maybe sometimes taken hostage by the mm. weak ones, yes. you know, in our church, yes. because they are just loud enough, shouting enough, yes. oh, we don't want this, yes. you know, and then everybody else is like, okay, well, we have to, you know, we can't be a stumbling block for you. Yes. Um, and I wonder if the ones who are shouting that loud, if they truly are that weak. Mm. Because I think the curse from that part of the, of the story of Paul is that we are assuming that weakness uh, accompanies conservatism. Mm. But what about the weak members of the church who have their hands on the door, back door handle, who are ready to step out because they don't see any acceptance for who they are, mm. because they are not necessarily the most conservative, but they are just so different, mm. right? And we, we, so we have, we have defined weakness in that congregational, ecclesiological context as a certain kind of being, as a certain set of certain statements. And it all has to do with, we have to do what we've always been doing. And that thus means weakness. And I think that is a, that is, that is a, this is a false, um, false, false equation there. It's not, uh, it, they're not equivalents. Weakness is the person whose needs are not being met. Like, and who needs it, not just who wants it for the, you know, comfort of their heart, but who needs it. And we sometimes forget that, uh, that we, they don't scream. They don't shout that loud. They just leave. They just, they just get lost somewhere in the cracks. And we think, oh, you know, they've gone astray. Well, we haven't actually taken care of the weak ones in the community because somebody has been loud, uh, shouting so loud. Another comment from our online viewers is, thank you for keeping it real and relevant. And now it just disappeared. No, here. Yeah. <laughs> um, the challenge is obtaining permission from leaders, under quotation mm. marks, who have no boxes to think outside of it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I don't work for the church. So I can say certain things, <laughs> I think. But no, what I, what I guess what I'm trying to say is that it's sad that that statement is real. Mm. That, that I have to say a statement like, I don't work for the church, so I can say certain things. But because I don't work for the church, I can also say that I wish our structures handled themselves from inside out from content to form. And I fear that in the rut of the daily trouble, a lot of the times it goes the other way around. And that the structures can become a burden in themselves. I have always supported the structures. I am within the structures. I am a believer of those structures if they live up to the thing they are supposed to be, which is a facilitator. So I would give them every chance. And now I'm, I don't know if, that, if they're going to sack Dihi now for that. But, <laughs> but if you really have tried inside out, and this is now on your conscience, because, because we, can, we can try 
for the legal side, or we can try with all of our gut, you know. If you really have tried from the inside out, with love and with care and with prayer and with the guidance of Holy Spirit, and it just nothing moves and you're a prisoner. You walk with Jesus, not with structures, if these two go separate ways. And the camera is being turned off. <laughs> yes. I have some random thoughts that are not yet developed, so I'm not sure whether this is going to become a comment or a question. Oh, just go for it. <laughs> but first of all, thank you so much for this workshop and all the thoughts that you are sharing. I guess I just want to share some thoughts regarding, uh, as we were preparing the worship for this Congress, um, I could recognize like going through a lot of like similar thinking yes. that you were going through because it, it has been, at least for me, like on a subjective level, has been really complicated, like process of thought, like realizing how many different cultures mm -hmm. there are represented that somebody would see this very <coughs> not okay and somebody would see it very much okay and maybe even a little bit too little. So, uh, and I've had conversations like from both spectrums. I'm actually very fascinated about that, like mm. how, like how vast difference there is. Yes. So, I guess like what I've been battling is is like what is the relationship between us just standing for what we believe is right and trying to st stretch the horizons. Yes. And between the mentality of serving, right? Yes. Like because I find those to be sometimes hard to balance. Yes. Because Really, if someone's in another culture, like, what right do I have than to just come and, like, just slap them, their face with drums, for an example? Yes. But, but, but at the same time, what rights do they have to, to come and then, you know, slap another culture, like, uh, by, by demanding that the percussion, for example, doesn't exist in music? Mm -hmm. so, so I find it so complicated. And, yes. and personally, has been a big, big battle for me to fi find that, like, okay, yeah. where do, yeah, middle ground, like, where do we fit in? Like, how can we serve, but yet not just like serve in a sense that, like, from a place where we are, like, or am I? I am like just a people pleaser or like mm. afraid of something. Yes. Uh, and yeah, those are just like some random thoughts that I wanted to collect together. And you were yes. also in AYS in Valencia, so yes. I think you, you would maybe. And uh, we were sweating and sweating <laughs> and sweating about it. Massive amounts of that, massive amounts of discussions. Um, yes, how much do you need to be not yourself when you're serving? Uh, that, is a, that is a massive question because, again, you might end up in a congregation, as I said, you might end up in a congregation where your needs, if you're constantly serving them, like the, the others, then your needs never get met, right? Uh, and then the alternative is that, that you are doing genuinity, you know, like you are authentic and not everyone else is like gibberish to me, right? This does not hit like any part of me. Youth Congress in some ways is a super complicated place. In other ways, as a genre, it's cool because you can just paint it on, oh, that's the youth. So if you play that card. Don't tell anyone that I said, well, it's the youth, <laughs> right? And the youth becomes this obscure, weird, monolith thing that is, you know, like, uh, is the, is the, it's, yes, it's unmovable and it, it, it always does the next thing, you know? It's like, it's the youth, duh. Um, and, uh, and like, uh, I'm so sorry you're so old in your heart. You can <laughs> but actually, the truth is that it is, it is also deceptive in that, right? Because it is immense diversity. We talk about, oh, we need to do something for the youth, thus it needs to be the latest one. And then I end up at Newbold College with completely normal young people saying, no, like hymns for me, please. You know, and I go like. <laughs> <laughs> so they, she's like, they, they're like, you, you are doing too much of the contemporary stuff. I'm like, oh, just, you know, <laughs> I'm the old one. <laughs> you don't know what you're talking about. Um, the Youth Congress is also wonderful because it happens for five days and we get to go home and get our, the diet, whatever we need, both food-wise and spiritually and whatever other thing, right? So I don't think... I, I know the struggle, that's what I'm saying. I think you guys are doing an amazing work 
it's wonderful and the amount of singing in the hall is the thing that you should go by. Um, those are two points. The third one is, if we were here for a full year, I would probably come and ask you to do some other songs as well. <laughs> and I think you yourself would want to do some other, th other songs. So, um, so like that, that's just what it is. That's inevitably what it is. You have to, and dissatisfaction will forever follow you wherever you go. <laughs> this is like my promise to you uh, that God should have said that when the, when the whole snake thing happened, it's like, you know, men, you over, slave away over there, women, you will, you know, labor in pain and dissatisfaction will forever you, whenever you do ministry, wherever you go. Um, because always people res will respond based on what their own needs are. There's a long-term plan, though, there, which is educating our old and our young to read spaces, not just from my perspective, but from a communal perspective, from the context. And I think that's something we are not very good at. We, we are not used to filtering our own feedback, asking those questions. Like, like a lot of, I, I, I heard comments about the first, about uh, the, the talk on the first evening, and, uh, and some t comments were in superlatives, and others were like, oh, it was just like a lecture, right? And the difference was that one person in superlative had arrived on Sunday. <laughs> and the person who said that it was just like a lecture, I could not follow it, had arrived after a long trip on Tuesday. Right? But the, but the, but the thing they are assessing is the sermon. The sermon was good or the sermon was bad. Um, I liked it. I didn't like it. It worked. It didn't work before going through the filters of why am I in that space where this has that type of an effect on me, right? Mm. And ultimately, in those discussions, if you are being slapped by somebody from France, um, <laughs> <laughs> then, then, uh, then, you, then you can ask them how they're doing and, uh, and turn, the, turn the entire discussion on the, on the question of, not about what is right and what is the wrong choice in this, but I am sorry that you haven't got your, you haven't got your, like, your, your type of sandwich or your cup of tea. And uh, let's find out ways how this can happen somewhere in the future. Like, that's the only thing you can do. Yes. I think, uh, is this food time? There's a different type of diet that needs help. Um, let's do it this way. Can, can we officially wrap it up? And then, uh, I'm not hungry. If you're not hungry, you can, you can uh, linger for a chat. Yes. Kert, thank you so much. This well, was really, you. really interesting. I think she deserves a really big applause for that. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. So, yeah. <laughs> to all our online viewers, thank you for uh, sending also your comments and your questions. Uh, be blessed uh, for uh, what follows afterwards, which is um, at 7 o'clock p.m., finish time, GMT plus two, daylight savings. We need to say those things so that you know what time it will be. We will continue again with our hybrid program where we will have a lot of content uh, produced during the week, uh, during the day. So please tune in and then we will join with the main service. So see you then. Bye. Thank you again. Thank you, guys. Really, thank you. <laughs> I didn't even get to give you the talk.